Welcome to Lesson 8, Euler's Method for First Order Initial Value Problems. We will see how to use Euler's Method, and we will use MATLAB to numerically solve and graph this initial value problem. The derivative of y with respect to x equals the function f of x and y. y of x0 equals y0. First, let's consider the tangent line approximation to a function. We'll find out that Euler's method is a numerical method that approximates the solution to a first order initial value problem. And Euler's method is based on the tangent line approximation of a function. If you have a function g, uh, it turns, and if g is differentiable, then it turns out that for small values of h, g of x plus h is approximately equal to g of x plus g prime of x times h. g prime of x is the first derivative of g at x. Here's a picture illustrating the situation. Suppose that this black curve is the curve y equals g of x. And suppose at some fixed number x, we look at this point right here, and we consider the tangent line to the curve at this point. This is, let's say, the tangent line here. Suppose you want to approximate the value of g of x plus h. Instead of trying to use this original function g, we could approximate that by using this tangent line instead. Tangent lines are linear, have linear equations and thus are more easily computable. If we look at this point x plus h on this horizontal axis, right here is g of x plus h um, for the y-coordinate. If we go up to this tangent line, just a little bit further up in this particular case, this point has y-coordinate g of x plus g prime of x times h. If h is small, so that these two numbers on this axis are close together, then the difference between the y values of these two points is going to be hopefully pretty small because at least for small values of h, this curve, g of x, can be approximated pretty accurately by this tangent line. So let's look at a typical problem, something like you might have seen in a Calculus 1 course. We know that the square root of 16 is 4. Let's use the tangent line approximation to approximate the value of the square root of 16.048. So here's what we'll do. We'll let g of x be the square root of x, since we're trying to find the square root of 16. Uh, g of 16 would be the square root of 16. So we know that g of 16 is the square root of 16, which is 4. That's easy to compute. But let's move just slightly away from 16 to 16.048. How could we approximate g of 16.048? In other words, the square root of 16.048. Suppose our calculator's battery has died and we are left to pencil and paper. So here's what we can do. We'll use that tangent line approximation formula where g of x, as we said, is the square root of x. In that case, if you differentiate the square root of x, that's the same as x to the 1 half power, g prime is 1 half x to the minus 1 half power. So we can write that as g prime of x equals 1 over 2 square root of x. So let's let x be 16, as we have up here. And let's let x plus h be 16.048, which is what we have here. So if x is this and if x plus h is this, h must be 0 0.048. So according to this tangent line approximation, g of 16 plus 0 0.048 is approximately g of 16 plus g prime of 16 multiplied by 0 0.048. So that's 4 plus, and then g prime of 16 is 1 over 2 square root of 16, and then that's multiplied by 0 0.048. The square root of 16 is 4, so this denominator is 2 times 4, which is 8. 
So this stuff becomes 4 plus 1 eighth times 0 0.048. Now 1 eighth times 0 0.048 is something that we can calculate easily either by pencil and paper or in our heads and that turns out to be 0 0.006. So 4 plus 0 0.006 gives us 4.006. So our approximation is the square root of 16.048 is about 4.006. If we type this into a calculator that gives us more decimal places, we would find out that our calculator would say something like 4.00599, and I think five after that, if I remember correctly. So this approximation is quite accurate because for one thing, the value of h was quite small and this function g of x equals the square root of x is a differentiable function and it doesn't change by great amounts for just slight variations in x. So now let's describe Euler's method. We want to approximate the solution to an initial value problem of this form. The derivative of y with respect to x equals f of x y. y of x naught equals y naught. This initial condition says that the point whose coordinates are x naught comma y naught is on the solution curve y of x. So for Euler's method, we'll start by picking a small value for h, and I'm going to restrict it to h greater than zero, uh, but this is not actually necessary. In step one, we'll let x sub one be x naught plus h, and then we'll calculate y sub one by using our tangent line approximation. Uh, y of x naught plus the derivative of y with respect to x at x naught times h. So y of x naught is y naught. The derivative of y with respect to x evaluated at x naught is f of x naught y naught. How do we know that? Because our solution function satisfies this differential equation. The derivative of y with respect to x has to equal f of x y. And then that last term has a factor of h in it, which we have right here. So this is just the tangent line approximation, and it gives us a value y sub 1, which is approximately the y value of our solution corresponding to an x value of x sub 1. It's an approximation because it's on that x1, y1 is on that tangent line uh, that we saw earlier. It's not necessarily on the solution curve itself. Now things get slightly different in steps 2, 3, and so on. Uh, the formulas that we'll have in step 2 look virtually identical to what we have in step one. We'll let x sub two equal x sub one plus h, and we'll let y sub two equal y sub one plus f of x sub one y sub one times h. Now, you might ask, why isn't this the tangent line approximation? Uh, well, here's the problem. y one is an approximate value that we got in step one of Euler's method, and we're not using an actual point that's on the solution curve down here. x1, y1 is a point on the tangent line approximation that we got in step one. So at this point, x1, y1 might be, and hopefully is, very close to a corresponding point on the solution curve. And normally it will be if our function f is well behaved and if h is pretty small. So it's kind of a compounding of an error here. x sub 1 is not quite uh, the, well, x sub 1 is the value uh, of x sub 1 plus h. Uh, so x sub 2 is a well-defined number that corresponds to a number on the horizontal axis. But when we calculate y2 here, we're using the previous step's value of y1 right here, 
and also right here. So it looks like the tangent line approximation, but it's slightly, it's for a line that might be slightly off the solution curve, but pretty close to a tangent line approximation if h is pretty small here and here. We have one h that we're using in all the steps. And we continue this way. So if you go to step n plus 1, x sub n plus 1 is x sub n plus h, y sub n plus 1 is equal to y sub n plus f of x sub n y sub n times h. And so this is also almost a tangent line approximation. Let's reiterate. The only known point to be on the solution curve y of x is the point with coordinates x naught, y naught. This was uh, from the initial condition in that initial value problem. The values y sub 1, y sub 2, y sub 3, y sub 4, and so on are computed approximations of y coordinates for points on the curve corresponding to the solution curve corresponding to the known values x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub 4, and so on. So as we go along from step 1 to step 2 to step 3 to step 4, we are getting a little bit more accumulated error each time as we go along. But if h is pretty small, hopefully the accumulated error will not be too big. As an example of Euler's method, let's consider this initial value problem. The quantity y minus 2 sine x dx plus x plus 15y squared times dy equals 0. The initial condition pi x of pi over y of pi over 2 equals 0. This problem we saw earlier in the lesson on exact ordinary differential equations. We found out at that time that an implicit solution to this initial value problem was x times y plus cosine 2x plus 5y cubed equals minus 1. So here's what we'll do. We will use a little bit of algebra on this differential equation up here, uh, subtract perhaps this term from both sides of the equation, divide both sides of the equation by a certain quantity, and we can rewrite this differential equation up here as the derivative of y with respect to x equals 2 sine 2x minus y over x plus 15y squared. We can see what happened here. This numerator was from here. This denominator was from right here. And this is going to be the derivative of y with respect to x equals f of xy. So f of xy is this rational function. Let's use Euler's method with a value of h that's pretty small. Let's let h equal 0 0.01. So in that case, Euler's formula, the iterative formula that we're going to use is y sub n plus 1 equals y sub n plus f of x sub n y sub n times h. Now, we know what f is. f is this function up here. So if we substitute what the function f of x sub n y sub n is, what we get for our iterative formula is y sub n plus 1 equals y sub n plus this fraction, which came right from here, times h. A MATLAB program to use this formula iteratively is quite short. And here it is. First, we let x sub 1 be pi over 2. That's what we have right here for the value of x sub 1. Now, you might ask, why didn't I say x sub 0 here? It turns out that MATLAB does not allow 0 to be an index value for an array. Index values have to be integers that are 1 or greater. After that, we'll set y sub 1 equal to 0. So these two first two lines basically say that y of pi over 2 equals 0. Then in our MATLAB program, we'll let h be 0 0.01 as we had up here. 
Now we have the iteration, a for loop. For n going from 1 to 300, let's let x sub n plus 1 equal x sub n plus h, and then y sub n plus 1, using this formula up here, is going to be y sub n plus 2 times sine of 2 times x sub n minus y sub n divided by, and then the denominator is x sub n plus 15 y sub n squared, which is what we see right here. And then that whole fraction is multiplied by h. So this loop is executed 300 times. These two statements are executed 300 times. The first time through the loop, n will be 1. And so this tells us how to compute x sub 2 and y sub 2 in terms of x sub 1 and y sub 1 and x sub 1. Similarly, when n is equal to 2, these two statements will compute x sub 3 and y sub 3. And by the time you get to n equals 300, we'll finally be computing x sub 301, y sub 301. And notice that since h is 0.01, 0 0.01 times 300 is just 3. So what we're doing is computing x and y coordinates here, where the x coordinates go from, what, pi over 2 to about pi over 2 plus 3. After this loop is completes its execution, we will plot the values in the array x versus the values in the array y. When we do that, we get a plot that looks like this. MATLAB will automatically open a figure window and put the plot of x versus y in that window. Now, if we look at this, uh, right here is where pi over 2 is. The first x value was pi over 2. And then by the time we get to, it looks like approximately 3, we hit a minimum. And then we start increasing again. And it looks like about 4.5 for the x value. We're back up to perhaps just about 0, maybe not quite there yet. So this is what Euler's method indicates the solution to our initial value problem up here probably looks like to hopefully a pretty good approximation. Let's compare two solutions. Here is the solution that we got from our MATLAB program. And over here is the solution we got in a previous lesson for exact ordinary differential equations. And we found an implicit solution. Now, pi over 2 on this graph is right about here. And 4.5 is right about here, I guess. So the part of the curve that corresponds to our Euler solution over here is the part that we have right here, where we start at height 0. We go down to a minimum value right here, which looks like it's about at x equals 3. And then we go back up here, and somewhere, maybe a little bit after 4, it levels off, getting pretty close to 0 again, doesn't it? So let's see if that corresponds to what we have over here. So this part of the curve that we saw right here should be this part of the curve, the whole curve, actually, that we see over here. At pi over 2, our value of the function is 0. And that's the same thing we had here. At pi over 2, the value of our function was 0. Then around x equals 3, we should have a minimum. And here, at about x equals 3, we have what looks like the minimum approximately there. And here, when we get to about 4.5, we're up to about 0 again on this graph. And here, when we get to 4.5 for the x value, it looks like the y value, once again, is just about 0. So this looks like it's much deeper than this one here. But that's just because 
here we have y coordinates going from minus 4 to 4. If you go down here, this is probably minus 5 to 5, actually. And the x-axis is going from minus 5 to 5 also. Here, we're just going in the x direction from pi over 2, which is 1.5, to not even 5. Somewhere around 4.5 was the last x value. The y-axis is quite different, too. Instead of minus 5 to 5 on the y-axis, we have minus 0.6 all the way up to 0.2 here. And so if we looked at the coordinates of these points here and computed them using these axes, we would find out that it's quite close to what we have here. It's just a difference in scaling. Let us talk about error estimation in Euler's method. So if we consider this initial value problem on an interval on the real line going from some number x naught to b, and we divide this interval into n equal length subintervals, and the length will be b minus x naught divided by n, let h equal that, then there's a constant c such that the error uh, y sub n minus y of x sub n is less than or equal to that constant times h. This quantity, let's look at it for one second. y sub n is our approximation for the value of y when the value of x is equal to b. y of x sub n is actually y of b, the true y value of the solution curve. And in absolute value, this is less than or equal to some constant times h, where h is the length of the subintervals that you used in that approximation. Well, the value of c depends on f, which appears here in this differential equation, and its derivatives. It depends, for instance, on the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y and also some other details that are usually met in practice. As n becomes larger and larger, and thus h gets smaller and smaller, because this error is bounded by a constant times h, this error becomes smaller and smaller. This type of result depends on the calculations being done exactly with no round-off error. The computer, these computers these days, often use 64 or 128 bits to represent real numbers, and thus the computer's representation of a real number is approximate itself. That is not taken into account with this formula. There are other numerical methods for approximating the solution to this type of initial value problem. There's one called the improved Euler method, that instead of using one tangent line approximation, at each step it uses the average of two tangent line approximations, one for each endpoint of the subinterval. And there are also methods called runge kutta methods that are often used. These are the most popular ones used. They're sometimes built into calculators these days, and computer mathematical software often has runge kutta methods already implemented that you can call and use. And these methods have errors, something like a constant times h squared or a constant times h to the fourth. There are runge kutta methods of order two and of order four. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope you have found it to be an enjoyable learning experience. If you're interested in ordinary differential equations, there are additional videos in this series covering most of the topics in an introductory course in ODEs. Have a good day.